I'm Audrey Schrader. And I'm Aaron Stolls. Today we are talking about westerns, classic genre that has survived through the years in the form of cowboy adventures. It's a pretty, pretty big genre to encompass a lot of movies, but it always follows the wandering cowboy or the lone gunslinger or the outlaw that comes to In town. In one way or the other. I mean, we all grew up with westerns. It's something that you, somebody says, hey, I'm going to go see a western. We already know what that encompasses. You're going to have your notorious outlaws. You're going to have your gunslinging heroes. But more than anything else, you're going to have that big frontier. You know, the Wild West, where, you know, anything goes, lawmen are corrupt, you know, rebels are the heroes. Everyone and makes their own laws. It's individual justice and retribution. <laughs> and, and the struggle is against the wilderness more than anything. You're on this dangerous fronti frontier, and that's the enemy. Exactly, and that's one of the reasons why the, the genre has held up for so long. It's, you know, we've always been what's out there in the unknown, and the West was the first big frontier, and that's one that the movie industry has capitalized on. It's been around for many years, and we saw a big lull in the Westerns, actually. They started back right away, um, their silent Westerns, you know, the Great Train Robbery is even considered a Western, mm -hmm. um, but through the years, you know, you get to the 1930s and 1940s and you start having John Ford making his westerns oh, and they yeah. were super iconic and, and you get some of the spaghetti westerns out of Italy uh, <laughs> and it, it was a genre that really blew up. Like the superhero genre for us now is, is easily the, the forerunner for the movies right now. But back in, in the 40s and 50s, the, your western, the western was what it was. And then you saw this big lull in the 70s and 80s and it was the shift focus, or uh, the focus shifted. It and did. Westerns and kind of dropped out of existence exactly. for a while. Exactly, part of that has to do with you know how special effects started to come into play around the 70s and 80s. So then you know we jumped out to different genres, things we can do. But believe me, today, the Western concept is definitely not dead. Um, perfect example, uh, just coming up, it'd be Seth MacFarlane's latest, latest and greatest creation, A Million Ways to Die in the West. In case you haven't heard of it yet, it's probably because the trailer for this R-rated comedy is too raunchy to show on the air. As the description reads, MacFarlane's latest Hollywood endeavor will follow a cowardly farmer who falls in love with a mysterious town newcomer but is then thrown into a chaotic adventure that puts his courage to the test when her husband, a notorious gunslinger with a bad attitude, comes to town. Although McFarlane starred in his first big screen success, Ted, Seth has taken up that role again in A Million Ways to Die in the West, making that his first big live action role. His name won't be the only one you recognize, though. This far out western is filled to the brim with big names. Charlize Theron will make her appearance at McFarlane's side while Liam Neeson takes up the reins as the notorious outlaw. Sarah Silverman, Giovanni Ribisi, and Neil Patrick Harris are also casted for big roles. The trailer features a plethora of McFarlane's signature humor, including well-timed violence, raunchy references, and comedic misfortune. To anyone who saw its head as more than just a movie made by Family Guy's creator, A Million Ways to Die in the West is certain to bring home the bacon. So, I'm pretty excited myself. I was a big fan of Ted when it came out. This, I had some questions as well, because you think, all right, well, what has this guy done before? He's worked on animation, he's worked on television, he's never even gone close to anything like a full live action movie. And Ted was a huge success. Now he's getting ready to make that jump again and take a first big dip into the western, westernized side of things. And, and, you know. and I never saw Ted, so I can't speak from judgment, but one thing that Seth MacFarlane really knows is satire. And he's this movie looks like it's going to be a huge satire. He's talking about you know, there's there's just a, there's a part in the trailer which we couldn't show, of course, where you know they're all standing in the graveyard burying a coffin, and he says, "I couldn't save her, I couldn't save her." And Seth MacFarlane goes, "She had a splinter, Doc. What were you supposed to do?" It, and it's just making fun of how everything seemed to be able to kill you in the West, how dangerous the frontier was. Yeah, and as MacFarlane says himself in the movie, anything in the West like that's not your friend is trying to kill you and that's just how it is and which makes for just a huge playground for this satire to just take off I mean everything from the, the gun every, the stereotypes are all there and you know we've got all those themes that have been stuck around for westerns you've got you know the, the notorious outlaw which was gonna be Liam Neeson of all people I think is well fitted for that role um, you've got you know the cute mis mysterious woman that moves into town nobody really knows anything about her I mean the tropes are all there and to see what McFarlane decides to do with that for this comedy is, there's no telling. I'd say I'd give a prediction, but there's really no way to predict it, because that's what's nice about a satire is, you know, you think it's going to go one way, and it goes way over your head. Well, and the nice thing about seeing this movie come out is that modern westerns are a thing that we don't see very often anymore. You really, 
you know, because I said the Westerns, they peaked. They peaked in the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. You know, you got a few in the 70s, and they kind of rolled back around, you know, late 80s, early 90s. But then there really hasn't been anything. And so in recent years, what we see are all cross-genre Westerns, like Jonah Hex, right, which is like right. a superhero movie, but also a Western. And, and so... You know, it, with the exception of the Coen brothers, who like to dabble in that yeah. genre quite a bit, the the western really isn't something that's been touched. It's this. It's a similar trope and storyline to like the knight errant in medieval times, the True. wandering knight that you know is a hero, or uh, noir films, the the lone detective solving the crime. So you get a lot of similar themes in other movies, but there's nothing quite like a classic Western. Right, right. And um, I think there's going to be a lot of that classic Western stuff that you know, we're kind of expecting to see pop up. But another big thing is, you know, you think about McFarlane's writing style. He does a lot of satire stuff in his television shows. It all has to do with current events and things like that. And, you know, that's something that's a huge appeal, a real draw to the people who are fans of his work. And even in the trailer, um, if you happen to see it, you can tell that a lot of the speech, they don't talk like they're in the Old West. They use a lot of, you know, the vernacular and funny little wording that we use today. And I think that's going to put a really interesting spin on this Western kind of stylized film. They don't make an effort to have every character have a traditional Western drawl throughout the whole movie. You know, you've got McFarlane right. talking in his normal voice, his McFarlane voice, and Charlize Theron using her American accent, but then Liam Neeson's doing his regular old I'm an Irishman thing. <laughs> and so, so I would think with the exception of uh, Neil, Patrick, Neil Patrick Harris and uh, maybe Amanda, Se Amanda Seyfried, mm -hmm. there's not really anyone in this movie who's hamming it up to be a Western trope. Uh, so they're, they're playing a lot off of you should view this not seriously. Don't don't take this movie seriously. Oh, not at all. When I'm, and I'm definitely going to go out and see this one when it comes out. But, you know, it just as anything else that the satire film is, and take it all with a grain of salt. I'm sure there's going to be plenty of our own modern day references and things like that. They're just going to seem a little off for a Western. But if you go in there thinking this is just going to be a wacky, wild adventure, I'm sure it's going to be great. Well, and they, they set the build up in the trailer to be that high noon showdown. Because Charlize Theron's character, you know, comes into town and kind of, you know, breaks the mold of the character and tells Seth MacFarlane, I'm going to teach you how to shoot. So you know that there's something coming up that'll be between him and Liam Neeson. Oh, and, you know it. And that just harkens back to the classic westerns, you know, uh, shootout at the OK Corral, high noon, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly with the western or the Mexican standoff. All those kinds of tropes, you know, uh, tumbleweeds and the shot from the hip and uh, ready oh, to go, you know. Oh, yeah, right in the trailer, you've got Liam Neeson. I know you're out there, Stark, which must be, you know, McFarlane's character. character as he peeks over a, a herd of sheep. So, you know, there's going to be, you know, that classic, you know, iconic protagonist against the evil, you know, antagonist, whatever it is, how it plays together. And, you know, it's, it's going to be a joke. It's, I'm not expecting it to be your traditional, you know, hero goes in to save the day, but it's going to be Seth MacFarlane, people. I mean, it, it is what it is, but it'll be fun. And it's going to be a lot of fun to see how it plays off. I mean, Liam Neeson, that's just for his character, for example. I've seen him play so many serious roles, and every now and then I think he's he made a joke of himself. And that's one thing I'm really excited to see is, you know, when we think, oh, Liam Neeson's going to be in this movie, that's huge. You know, he's going to be this tough, gritty Irishman like he normally is, and he doesn't break that character at all. So seeing him in a satire, I'm sure there are going to be jokes made. And any actor that can go out there and make fun of themselves, oh, yeah, they're A+, a plus in my book. Well, and it's interesting to set it up like that with Liam Neeson. For lack of a better term, he's playing a Clint Eastwood type character. Even though Clint Eastwood was traditionally your good guy, it's the real hard-nosed, quiet guy, um, and the gunslinger. And that's what we're getting from Liam, ne Liam Neeson. The thing that we're not really getting is the wandering cowboy. And you can't talk about westerns without talking about John Wayne. John Wayne is your, oh, yeah. your stereotypical, he's the wandering cowboy, he's the former army general, uh, and he's just trying to make his way now that the Civil War is over. Uh, and there's all kinds of John Wayne movies. You know, his, he got to start in stagecoach as a young ranch hand, uh, yeah. just rescuing, escorting a stagecoach, rescuing, you know, the hooker with a heart of gold and all of that stuff. I mean, John Wayne's a legend. 
Exactly. He, he, I, in my opinion, the way I grew up, he built the franchise. He was the first big name. Maybe not the first big name, but the one that definitely stands out and is recognizable by everybody. He shaped the genre. He really did. And John Ford, you know, was a director that he worked with a lot. I know John I dropped Ford that name John earlier, together. but oh, yes. the scenery you get in John Ford's movies is all Monument Valley, Utah, mm -hmm. and they they really changed the face of Westerns, um, especially since you used to have that subplot of, you know, the, the savage Indians, and they're always the bad guy. And they tried to change the shape of that and make the Native Americans like sympathetic characters right. um, quite make you question a little bit of what's going on as far as the motivations of the cowboy but that image of the cowboy riding off into the sunset at the end is something that you, you just uh, your heart just races at the end of the movie or the TV show you know because the TV shows Lone Ranger Bonanza Rawhide oh yes all the old TV shows and you know Clint Eastwood was in uh, Bonanza too mm -hmm. very true and uh Man, I just, I grew up, I grew up with John Wayne. So, I mean, when I, I, I love his movies, I love, I love Westerns, and I'll just come out and say it. I'm a huge fan of Westerns, and I anything that says, oh, John Wayne's involved, or, oh, they're going to go back to a Western satire movie, I'm thrilled, because I love satire. Some of my favorite movies are just movies that go out to make fun of a genre, and I think taking a Western and a comedy, I mean, we have, like, Blazing Saddles back in, like, I want to say that was the 70s. Something and, like that, And that yeah. was huge because it, it made fun of itself. And I'm not sure that this is going to go that far to that that extreme, but we're going to see all those tropes and all that that we've come to know and love and come so familiar with definitely going to make an appearance here. And when you're talking about Westerns, you know, we've talked about the high noon standoff and the cowboy, the wandering cowboy, the lone gunslinger, the, <sighs> the young intrepid sheriff, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But it all comes down to the music at the end of the oh. day. That high noon standoff, the camera angles, the hard light, the, the reds and the oranges, and then the music as the tumbleweeds roll by. Yeah. And it's, it's just classic music and everybody knows it, you know? Makes the, it. Ooh. Mow, mow, mow. <laughs> For a little more breakdown on this though, we're actually gonna throw it over to our soundtrack station with Jess. So Jess, take it away. Of course, guys. Westerns contain a lot of tropes and the music is no exception. Everyone knows their traditional high noon standoff song with the whistling and harmonica. This iconic piece is the work of Ennio Morricone, the composer for the Italian spaghetti western The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Morricone wrote the piece to resemble the howling of a coyote and tried to utilize unusual elements such as gunfire, whistling, and yodeling. Another cowboy classic is Do Not Forsake Me, the main theme of the movie High Noon. The song harkens back to the cowboy ballads of old, representing the wandering cowboy on his journey. Cowboy music has made its mark on the silver screen as well, with such classics as, the, as Rawhide, Bonanza, and of course the William Tell Overture as heard in The Lone Ranger. The common theme in all of these pieces of music is the acoustic guitar, whether it's winsome or upbeat. Whatever the composition, there's no doubt these Western classics will remain a staple of the genre. I mean, there Thanks, you have it. Jess. Thanks, Jess. Appreciate it. <laughs> I mean, and as just as she was telling us, there's going to be a lot of those points brought back, just as uh, McFarland showed in his trailer. So uh, things like gunshots you know, put into the beats, the acoustic guitar, you know, the, the whistling of the wind as the tumbleweeds come across the valley. Yes, all of that's going to be included, and I'm. I'm stoked. It's great to see a contemporary Western because like I was saying before, you know, you got the Coen brothers, No Country for Old Men, their remake of True Grit, mm -hmm. uh, the animated Western Rango starring Johnny Depp. That's which, right. That's probably the closest we've gotten to a comedy Western in recent years um, is, you know, Rango's this lizard who's kind of out of place and finds himself in this Western town. Uh, facing off against a big outlaw snake. Exactly. I love the soundtrack of that movie. Now, I can't believe I forgot about it. I mean, it was brilliant. I mean, it, it, ro it rose up to the top and it came down real low. And all the, the high points of the film, there was just a brilliant score to go with it. It so. was everything that you expected from a Western score, very reminiscent of the, the wild land out west, the unsettled frontier. And we're getting a lot of that with Seth MacFarlane's movie, too. There's a lot to look forward to besides the soundtrack. We just, there's just not enough that can be said about this movie. I I'm so ramble, excited I to see it. I could ramble on for days about it. I mean, I think it's coming out May 30th or so. So May 30th, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to be there at midnight for this one. <laughs> I'll have my cowboy hat on and everything, waiting to go. So. <laughs> it's definitely one that we look forward to. We hope that it becomes something of a classic as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. But we will be back right after this break with more news about Westerns. 
you drive buzzed, it could cost you around $10,000. You'll face major legal fees, major fines, and steep insurance penalties. You could lose everything. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Hey folks, welcome back to Real Talk. As Audrey and I were just talking about westerns as a uh, movie genre, I also wanted to dip into something a little different. Now, as we were talking about, there's been contemporary westerns, there's been different types of films, satire western, we're talking about Seth MacFarlane's latest film, A Million Ways to Die in the West. But I want to jump into something a little bit different, the space western. When we're talking about westerns, you're going, space, western, how does that fit together? But westerns actually cross over a lot. Um, mm -hmm. it, one of the things you might not expect is there's a lot of samurai westerns that come out from Hong Kong and Japan. Um, and so that's one of those genres. And you get sci-fi westerns and steampunk westerns and different things like that. But the space western is a genre that kind of has been expanded on quite a bit. And most most famously probably in the form of Firefly, Joss Whedon's television yes. show, short-lived, got canceled, got a movie, Serenity, um, mm -hmm. and kind of launched Nathan Fillion's career. But as far as the genre goes, it can be as simple as Cowboys in Space, which is literally what Firefly is, <laughs> or you could have something a little more subtle, like Aliens with Sigourney Weaver. A lot of people don't think of that as a Western, but it's a group of settlers coming to a native land that is inhabited by indigenous peoples that are hostile. There you and go. And that's, that's as simple as that is. And, and her character, Ripley, is considered your wandering cowboy. Mm -hmm, definitely. And that's what's cool about Space Western is you can think, some people think there's really two ways you can go with it. You can take space and bring it down to the West, and we have movies like Cowboys versus Aliens, and then we have the more expanded on side of it, which is taking the final front, you know, space, the final frontier, and you know, take the West and take everything we love about the West and send it out to the stars. So uh, uh, something that a lot of people don't consider is that there's a lot of famous movies that fall into space westerns. Mm -hmm. But I don't think a lot of people are familiar with the genre. It's kind of a cult genre. It's something that... If you know it, you know it. And if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's hard to find. It's something that people don't always talk about a lot. Um, so it's, it's one of those genres that's kind of hidden and it slips through the cracks. You don't really always catch it. Not everybody yeah. knows about it. Um, to illustrate this point, we hit the streets and we that went we and did. talked to some people. So we're going to show you that now. Do you know what a space western is? No idea. Can you take a guess? Is it some type of omelet or something? It would be a western movie that involves aliens. It's cowboys in space, what's not to like? <laughs> cowboys in space? Uh, shows like Firefly. That's the only one I can think of. Um, a planet that's in the west in space. Uh, does that have to do with robots versus cowboys? Uh, <laughs> something like that. Something okay. like that. Well, I might be wrong about this, but I believe Star Wars is in that category. Yes, then Star Wars. Like a movie? Yes, a movie. <laughs> Do you know what type of movie it would be? Like a c Cowboys and Aliens type of movie? I do know what a space western is, such as Firefly. A western in space. <laughs> I'm with Getty Avery. He's lost his voice. But Getty, do you know what a space western is? I will take that as a yes. It sounds like a hotel. <laughs> so there you have it. Not everyone knows what a space western was, but we had quite a few people that were familiar or at least made educated yeah, guesses. They tried. I mean, it really is a night and day difference. You can tell. The folks that know a space western know it. Hey, you know, like Firefly. Hey, you know, like Star Wars. I mean, like, I guess it's an omelet. <laughs> so, I mean, which I mean, hey, western omelet, I see where he's coming from. But either way, I mean, it does, the day and night, and it's, it's hard to really get into any kind of series unless you have a friend that says, hey, I found this show, you gotta check it out, or oh, you gotta see this movie. Oh, what kind is it? It's a space western. So, I mean, the lines are blurred as to what, what counts as what, but I mean, the biggest one I say that most people don't even think about as a space western would probably be Star Wars. Yeah, and Michael, who we interviewed, mm -hmm. mentioned Star Wars as a space western. Everybody thinks, oh, it's just a sci-fi action adventure, but really, if you look at it, you've got 
you know, your young ranch hand, Luke Skywalker, wants to get <laughs> off his ranch and explore the wilderness as it's available to him. Right. And he falls in with kind of an outlaw gunslinger, Han, Han Solo. Solo. <laughs> and and uh, for lack of a better term, Chewbacca is representative of your Native American character. Silent type, not everybody understands him, just the gunslinger who's learned to speak to him. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> for all intents and purposes, your cast of characters, it, you know, you've got Princess Leia who is your belle of the ball, but she's kind of a tough woman. And so <laughs> Star Wars does fall into that category, but not a lot of people realize it. Definitely. I mean, I mean, you can think of like Darth Vader, for an example, is going to be that like that gunslinging outlaw, you know, guns, lightsabers, you know, tomato, tomato. It is what it is. But I mean, when it all comes together in the end, the concepts are all there. The tropes are there. Um, you've got this, this team of wandering through fighting this war, you know, it could be a battle between, it doesn't, really doesn't matter. It could be a, in one Western, it might be a corrupt sheriff, you know, in Star Wars, you've got the Empire. And for all intents and purposes, the Empire exists just as this entity that that doesn't have enough control to regulate everything. So you get mm -hmm. the lawlessness that happens in Westerns and like Deadwood, places like that. Oh yeah. Um, so it's, you know, kind of a play by your own rules morality in that kind of universe. And so Star Wars really fits right into those lines. But another another classic, Star Trek. They say yeah. space, the final frontier. It's in the tagline of the <laughs> Spelled show. Spelled out for you right there up in front. You're right. Space, the final frontier. As you know, as the Enterprise goes out to see these lands. Explore still, still, unknown <laughs> worlds. There it is. You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, they, they interact with all the indigenous peoples. You know, prime directive is don't disturb them. Don't influence them and of course they fail miserably a lot of the times <laughs> but you still get this group of intrepid explorers these cowboys going out and exploring the universe the last unexplored wilderness definitely and i mean those are two big names that i guarantee everybody if they haven't seen them they've at least heard of them and you know most people don't think oh what kind of movie is star wars you think oh it's sci-fi and you just leave it at that. You don't really think anything further of it. But, you know, if you really delve into it, it's, it's more than just a sci-fi film. You've got movies about just robots that classify as sci-fi films. But, you know, when there's more to it, you take, and like you were saying earlier, with a good Western, good Western film takes two concepts and really kind of mashes them together. You know, like whether it's satire, like Blazing Saddles, or if it's like something out in space is just another combination to give. So you've got Star Wars, Star Trek, and honestly, on the animation side of things, um, folks who know it more like cult classic television shows such as Trigun is a perfect example. If you've never heard of Trigun, it's about this wandering wandering gunsman, you know, travels through the West and there's the barren lands and the, even the music, things like that. And folks that know it know of it and they think, yes, that's a space Western. But if you don't, it's one of those things you really don't go out and find. Right, and, and while you're talking about Trigun, you know, that's an anime that definitely qualifies mm -hmm. as a space western, you got to mention Cowboy Bebop. Oh, Cowboy yes. in the name, but it is definitely one of the best examples of a space western that there is. Um, and, and when you say the genre, I, you know, I said, oh, people think of Firefly, but the second one that gets mentioned is Cowboy Bebop, usually. Yeah, you're right. Firefly being the first big name, Cowboy Bebop being the second, and then just, it, it really kind of shattered. And even as an anime, as an, you know, an animated television show, it only lasted a single season. But at that, it broke a lot of genre boundaries that existed before it. You've got, you know, Spike, the... Cowboy Bebop. He's a cowboy gunsman. You know, not too. Don't. He's strong and silent. Not much really known about him. Gets thrown into this adventure with a obnoxious woman. You've got Faye, the beautiful woman. You've got um, the on this ship just traveling across the galaxy, finding work where they can. A lot of parallels with Firefly, if you're familiar with that. But um, one thing that it definitely did was it took the the concept of the cowboy and threw it into something more than just into space, but like what would it be like to be out in that kind of atmosphere? You know, they travel through, they've got parts where they run out of gas, and you know, it's like, what do you do from there? It's like being stuck out in the West without a horse. And it's a lot of parallels there that you really don't think about, but when you see it, you're like, wow, that's, that's like what it'd be like in the West. And yeah, I'm throwing the West back and forth, but the, the point to really pull from it is that there's so much there that you wouldn't have gotten from comparing it to the West. You'd have been like, oh, sure, it's, it's in space. It is what it is. But the space Western is a genre. It's just, there's so, there's so far to expand on it. 
Right, it's, and and you don't have to have that traditional Western setting. There's a lot of space westerns that do have a Western setting. You know, Cowboys versus Aliens yes. is set in the West, and you know, Aliens come to Earth and chaos ensues. Mm -hmm. uh, and Daniel Craig plays your hero in that one. <laughs> but the the way that it works with the space western is that it doesn't have to be set in the west. It can just have the parallels of those themes. You know, the wandering gunsman, the lone cowboy, the the whole trope of, you know, settling an unknown world. And so mm. a lot of science fiction falls into that category without people really even realizing it. There are some, you know, that blatantly hit you over the head with Look at us dressed as cowboys. We are in space. We're cowboys in space. And and you get a lot of that. But at the same time, sometimes, especially like, I'm going to bring up aliens again. Sigourney <laughs> Weaver plays Ripley. And she Perfect is example. a sole survivor. And everyone around her, you know, is there to support her. But mm -hmm. eventually, you know, the natives, the savage natives pick them off. And she's got to be the lone fighter in the standoff again against the hive mother at the end. And that's that's the high noon standoff right Perfect. there. Yeah, you know, fight off the Savages reminds me of the Reavers from Firefly, and I'm going to jump onto that boat right now because it's one of the most iconic space westerns of all time and still standing one of the most popular. Um, Joss Whedon, who most people who now know him to be the director of the Avengers movies, directed Firefly. Only lasted, I want to say, about 13 episodes before it was canceled, but the fan base that rose up from this show alone, and they're, they're, they're dedicated to it, brown coats as we call them. And, you know, finally we got a resolve when Serenity and finally got the whole storyline wrapped together as a movie. But as it stands, that whole universe, this, this rugged crew of mismatched pirates, for lack of better description, get thrown together in all these adventures, taking whatever job they can, um, whether it's legal or not. Just like the West, lawless land, you do what you can. Right, and that's, it's something that has a similarity to Star Wars and stuff as well, um, because you've got the Alliance taking mm. the place of the empire, kind of this exactly. overbearing government that doesn't really have the power to regulate all the new lands that have been terraformed. Um, and so you do get Captain Mal Reynolds and his crew going through all these worlds, and uh, they, you know, they explore new worlds, they face new alien creatures, they have to handle it all on their own, um, you know, and they're all good with the weapons. And that actually brings us to our DVD of the week, which I think you brought with I you. I did indeed. In fact, while we're on the topic of it, I'm going to go ahead and recommend it. Joss Whedon's Firefly. By far one of the best TV series I've ever seen. And if you're going to jump into space westerns, this is definitely the best place to start. Um, the character interaction, everything from the characters to the atmosphere to the adventures they go on is so well written. I mean, it's, it really is sad that it only lasted as long as it did, but for only being 13 episodes, it's just chock full of everything that you could possibly want out of a space western. This is one of the space westerns that kind of it hits you over the head with worst space cowboys. You got Captain Reynolds in his red button-up shirt with his gun holsters and his brown trench coat and uh, you know he's handy with a weapon and and so you've got him as your classic hero and he's kind of a conflicted guy um, and you've got Zoe and Wash of course married couple pilot and right-hand man to the captain. You've got Jane Cobb who is the mercenary for hire who just happens to find his way on the ship, which is really interesting how he even gets on the ship. They buy him out while they're in the middle of fighting with him. So, I mean, just characters that are just so rich and full of their own backstories. There's just so much to pull from. Right, it. and and going more with the tropes, you've got Inara, who plays kind of a courtesan character, which is a mm. respected profession in the Firefly universe. Oh, yeah. But she's definitely fits into that hooker with a heart of gold role. And, definitely. you know, Kaylee Fry is on the ship, Simon and River, of course. And there's this whole big mystery, this big conundrum, but... But if you're looking for a Western, you look no further. They transport cattle in one of the episodes. <laughs> I remember One that. of my favorite episodes, Mal wears a nice floral calico bonnet. <laughs> They're on a covered wagon. It is, you cannot get more stereotypically oh, Western. I swear by my pretty, pretty little bonnet, I will end you. Man, One of the best lines, one of many, many good never lines forget from it. this show. So, and there's a reason why this show was Nathan Fillion's first big launch in his career. So, Firefly, find it. Watch it. I believe it's on Netflix if you have access to Netflix. It is so. absolutely on Netflix. And Serenity is the follow-up movie, which is definitely something you want to watch. But that is definitely what we want to recommend to you for our DVD of the week. Well, I think you know what it's time for. Movie Minute. The Movie Minute. 
Bodybuilder Lou Ferrigno is no stranger to the Incredible Hulk, having played the green guy in the 1970s television series and lending his voice to the character over the years. Marvel has confirmed that Ferrigno will reprise his role in the Avengers Age of Ultron. Producing and writing duo Robert Orchie and Alex Kurtzman have been Hollywood's go-to couple for many of the blockbuster movies in the recent years, but they announced that they are parting ways in order to pursue separate projects. Orchie hopes to direct Star Trek III as his first film. After 30 years, Steven Spielberg says he has a story for a sequel to the treasure hunt classic The Goonies. Whether the film stars will be involved remains to be seen. Mystery Science Theater 3000, the cult comedy series that riffed off poorly made B-movies, recently celebrated its 25th anniversary. Creator Joe Hoxton says the show will be revived in an online format this summer. The third Hobbit movie now has a new subtitle. Originally titled There and Back Again, the final installment in the trilogy is now called The Battle of the Five Armies. Fox Studios has finally purchased the rights to remake classic TV series Flash Gordon. The sci-fi adventure debuted back in 1934 and will now have a chance at the big screen. If you saw that, oh. you a time. That's all we got. That's everything we we have for the Movie Minute, and that's all we have for Real Talk. Thanks for joining us. I'm Audrey Schrader. And I'm Aaron Stolls. Take it easy, folks. We'll see you next time.